to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I am Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your host for Commission Ed. Okay, Reed. So judging by the popularity of previous episodes about officer training school or OTS and the frequency of OTS-related questions that we have received, I have a feeling that there is a demand out there for more information about OTS and what it's like both as a cadet and as an instructor. So let's give the people what they want. How do you feel about that? Happy to do it. Yep, we do get a lot of questions and we love them. Thank you, audience. Keep them coming. That is one of the most fun things, aside from hanging out with you, Colin. It is fielding those questions from Instagram, Facebook, email, whatever it is. So we appreciate them. Keep them coming. And uh, yeah, let's get down to it. Cool. So Reed, as far as you're able without ruining the training experience and knowing that things have changed and will continue to change, why don't you take some time, tell us what it's like being a cadet at officer training school. Yeah, love to. So I do want to emphasize those two points you made. I'm not going to give anything away that's going to compromise OTS's ability to provide students the best training they can. I'm not going to give away any, you know, super secret things about training because the staff there deserve it as well as past, present, future students. They deserve the best opportunities they can. And that's part of it a little bit is a little bit of mystery. And yes, change is constant. So I only departed there as an instructor about 18 months ago. And there have been massive changes since I left. And change is going to keep coming. So I'll do my best. I entered officer training school a little over nine years ago last month. Pretty crazy how fast that's already happened. But yeah, so we'll get down to it. This perspective is going to be from a non-prior civilian applicant. I'll try to bring in some prior enlisted differences as we go, but that's the perspective I'm bringing to this. So first, it starts with leaving home. The day's finally arrived. And this is going to be a pretty different experience than any other military reporting or experience that you've probably seen on movies or things like that. As I understand it, when you enlist, your recruiter is responsible for delivering you to the military entrance processing station or MEPS. And then you're put on a bus. Basically, the Air Force kind of takes you and you are in their care. Same when you show up to the Air Force Academy. They've they've got you and they take care of you. That is not what happens for OTS. You go to the MEPS. Your recruiter may or may not meet you there. Mine did not. Simply said, make sure you're there at this time. You show up. The people at the station, they give you a packet full of important paperwork. It's a large manila envelope. They say, be safe, be good, and be on time. And then you're on your own. And for me, that meant driving from northern Utah to central Alabama. So very different experience than I think a lot of people have experienced when they either went to basic training or some other sort of a session source. Real quick, Reed. So prior to this time, you've been working really closely with that recruiter to get you through the application process and to get you a class date and get you the orders, everything that you need in order to actually go to OTS. Yes, that is accurate. Now, the application process was very intense and there was a lot of regular contact. But once the application was submitted, there was quite a bit of waiting, actually. So I would say for me, it was about three or four months, quite a flurry of activity, then a number of months of nothing. My board was actually delayed. And so the board date kept getting pushed back and pushed back. And he would check in every couple of weeks and be like, hey, nothing heard. Take care of yourself. So we'd exchange emails and phone calls every once in a while. Once the board selection was announced, that period from the start of application to the board announcement was nine months. So, you know, pretty big gap of lots of hurry up and wait. Tale of things to come, right, Colin? That's part of our life. (laughs) Yep. So after selection, I did not have a class date. And so he said, first thing, when you're selected, you have to formally declare that you are committing. So I actually went down to MEPS 
in what's called the delayed enlistment program. And, and there's a lot of folks that do that as part of their signing contracts when they go to basic training and enlist and other things like that. This was essentially a way for me to get on paper and start being tracked by the Air Force. It also allowed me to get on base so I could do other things like go to physical training. I could meet my recruiter much more easily if I needed to go for whatever reason. You know, I basically had kind of orders like it was the depth paperwork allowed me to do a lot of things. Anyway, then it was another nine months after my selection before I actually reported. So there were some big gaps in there. But yes, I did work with them and we did have appointments. I did go to MEPS for physical things. And but yeah, he and I did work together. But I will say what I expected is not what happened. I expected a little bit more hand holding, a little bit more, okay, now, Mr. Gan, you're going to go over here. And that was not the case. It was a whole lot more, well, here's the address. Don't be late. And I'm like, yeah, it's four states away. Okay, there's a big storm coming. So we drove. Anyway, it's a long story, but it wasn't what I expected from that. Like someone's going to take you and take you through this experience. Now you still had to go out and get after it. Yeah, that was kind of my point. And what I was hoping that you'd explain is that you worked really closely with the recruiter up to this point, And now the, the recruiter's like, well, see you later. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, literally, here's your packet. Be good. Don't be late. I mean, that was it. So I've got this paperwork that's my entire life, you know, and I'm just like taking care of it like it's my child or something. So then we drove. So I actually carpooled with a friend. He had been working with the same recruiter I had. Turned out we lived pretty close to each other and got the same class date. During those intervening months, we were actually doing some training together, physical training. It was pretty cool. I enjoyed that quite a bit. and made my experience better. I'm still in touch with him to this day. Anywho, so we carpooled there. Now arrival at OTS is again, semi let down, you know, again, it's not the, what you see at like Marine boot camp where there are these yellow footprints and you show up and there's someone there to greet. It was very different. So again, they say you need to report between the hours of like 0, 0800 and 1600 on day X. And uh, my companion and I that were driving out together, we figured we didn't want to be too early because we didn't want to receive all the attention all day. We knew that as soon as we got there, it'd be a pretty sporty experience. We also didn't want to be too late and be rushed. So we figured right in the middle of the day seemed like a good idea. But again, really low key. You drive up to the gate at Maxwell Air Force Base. I don't recall if I had a set of orders with me or if I had my packet or if I used my delayed enlistment paperwork. I don't recall. But essentially, I just said, I'm here to go to OTS. And they basically just like said, okay, thanks. And like pointed down the road. Again, not what I expected. And then we just kind of had to find our way around the base, trying to find the campus of OTS. Again, not sure what I expected, but it certainly wasn't that. I expected a little bit more signs. There were a few. But yeah, just uh, you followed the instructions they gave you and you had to figure it out. And I think that was a sign of things to come. So pulled up to the parking lot, see the campus of OTS. You know, you'll see students every once in a while. They'll go out there and take their picture in front of the sign. And it's kind of fun. You have no idea what's coming. Anyway, so parked the car, get out, and there's this nice young man. He's wearing a uniform. He had these odd-looking ranks on his collar. He had us get our luggage. You know, he put it in these piles. We made sure it was labeled. He gave us name tags. He was very calm and relaxed. And then he said, are you guys ready? And we're like, well, yeah, I mean, we're here. You know, we're ready. <laughs> Turns out we were not ready. He escorted us to a group of upperclassmen and our training began. Now, when I went through OTS, OTS was structured in a way that there were two classes always on campus, an upper class and a lower class. The upper class had already been on campus for six to seven weeks and had just moved up, if you will, from being the lower class. And the idea was for the next six to seven weeks, they would then train the lower class in a safe environment where really nothing bad can really happen. And it allows them to put in practice what they had just been taught for the previous six, seven weeks. There's a lot of good with that model. And there's a lot of bad with that model. At the time, I was not thinking about the pros and cons. I was just worried about not screwing up, giving you know the proper greeting of the day, saluting properly, walking, standing, eating, breathing properly. Everything we did was scrutinized from the second that young gentleman said, are you guys ready? And we foolishly said that we were. We basically couldn't do anything right for the next, oh, I don't know, 10 days felt like. I don't recall a whole lot more 
about the first six or seven hours of training, other than I knew that I was not good at this, at least at that point. I met my roommates. In my room at OTS, there were three beds and three desks. So there were three of us in our room. In our flight, there were something like 14. The reason I don't remember is the numbers actually changed quite a bit during my time. We lost some people that self-eliminated from training. We gained somebody from the upper class that had washed back. And then we lost someone else from an honor code violation. And I'm pretty sure I'm forgetting someone that was there a few days anyway. So the flight number fluctuated quite a bit for the first couple of weeks before it kind of settled down. Now, Reed, what you've kind of described so far, you're painting a picture in my mind of like full metal jacket. You like you walk into this environment and there's a gunnery sergeant, obviously not a gunnery sergeant because this is the Air Force, not the Marines. Mm -hmm. But there's somebody there wearing a hat who is just ready to tear you into pieces and, and call you Joker. Now, is that exactly what it was like? Or can you say? The reason the first 10 minutes of Full Metal Jacket are so brilliant is because of how accurate they are. Now, yes, there are a number of things that you can't swear basically anymore in the training environment. I was never personally demeaned. I was never accosted like you see. but. I certainly was in a tense, stressful environment, and I was pretty certain I couldn't even breathe right. And that's what I mean. So yeah, and it started the second we showed up. It was overwhelmingly the upper class. So some of these people had been in the Air Force a whopping six weeks, but some of them were prior enlisted that had been in for 10, 12, 14 years. So yeah, the reason those 10 minutes are brilliant is because they're brilliant, and it's not too far distant from my experience. So. Yeah, absolutely. So for the audience, we're not saying go watch Full Metal Jacket in preparation for you to go to OTS because that's what it's going to be like. But go watch Full Metal Jacket so that you have an idea of what it might be like. Yes. Yep. Clear as mud. <laughs> for those that have been through it, they smile and they go, yep, I know that guy. You know, we all have that vision of that person. Oh, man, I'm smiling just thinking about it. All right, so let's get back to my roommates. Uh, one of them was a prior enlisted guy. Uh, he had eight years active duty. And seriously, he didn't even look phased. I mean, I was so scared. I wasn't sure that I would ever like come down from this elevated heart rate stress. I wasn't sure. And I'll never forget the first night. So I'm just going to tell you this, just exactly how it happened. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. So the day seemed a whole lot longer than it was. Again, I can't remember everything that happened, but lights out is 2300. And that's 11 p.m. for all you civilian types. So we're all tucked in our beds. Lights are out. And exactly 2300, I mean, on the dot, the upper class screamed down the hall, Good night, OTs. Now, at the time, we were not cadets. We were officer trainees. I think they've actually gone back to that now that commissioned officer training and officer training school has been integrated. So you have officers that are already in training anyway. I'm not sure, but at the time, we were OTs. And I mean, it literally sounded like some scream of some demonic creature sent to torture me. Like, I mean, that's what it felt like. <laughs> and I am just despondent. Right. I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. That's what I was thinking to myself. I was in the top bunk. My prior enlisted roommate was below me. And then we had another guy that was off to the other bunk and such a good guy. And he just like super calmly, just like, just get through today. There'll be another day tomorrow. We'll get through that one too. And I literally lost it. I started sobbing in my bed. I'm just like, <laughs> you know, wiping my face. <laughs> and I told him later, but that little like motivate that that was the only nice thing anyone had said to me in what seemed like an eternity. And that gave me like what I needed to get through it. Here I am. I'm 28 years old. I'm a father of two. I'm a published author. And I was a bubbling mess up on my bunk thinking I'm never going to be able to do this. <laughs> and I have to say that feeling of uncertainty if I'm going to get through this experience has stayed with me a little bit. I don't want to say it's a negative stress, but it definitely is something that pushes me. I feel this pressure to not fail, this pressure to improve, this pressure to make sure I get through it. Because when you think about all the pressures that you put on yourself when you go to officer training school, I had committed my family, this is how I was going to feed my children. 
And here I am, not even 10 hours in, and I'm like, man, I am not sure if this is going to happen. So that motivation kind of stuck with me, and it still has. Anyway. Well, yeah, and like you mentioned a few weeks ago, you've been deployed to the United Kingdom for the last six months. And same idea, you have to take that one day at a time. You have to get through this one, even if you're unsure that you'll be able to get through this day. And then tomorrow there will be another one and you'll get through that one too. You just take it one day at a time. Yeah, that simple act of kindness that he was aware of how we were feeling was so valuable to me, so valuable. And I know that he knew that because he had already been through this through basic training. So yeah, huge respect. That guy meant a lot to me, still does. He'll come up later as we go. Anyway. Lights on is at 0430 promptly. That's early, just in case people aren't used to getting up that early. Yeah, 0430 is still 430 a.m. for all you civilian types. <laughs> yes, it is. Very good. Yep. <laughs> and it's not like a, okay, the lights go on, you get your phone, you kind of take a minute. No, it's you're awake, you're out of bed, you're dressed, and you're standing at attention in the hall so that they can take accountability for you. And it's shocking how hard it is to count when you're stressed, tired, and scared. And you just need to count everyone so that it, you know everyone's there. And training began immediately. Quick shower, march to PT, march back, rooms ready for inspection, make sure you have all your academic materials, learning begins, memorizing your quotes of the day, et cetera, et cetera. And it just started at 4.30. And you were going 1,000 miles an hour from lights on to lights off. And... That is a long time to work really hard. And then during that night, I mean, I would hit the pillow and I would go to bed immediately. I was completely out. And then watch, rinse, repeat. You just did this every day. And as soon as you figured out how to do one thing, they would add something else. They would add something else. They would add something else. And it just was shocking, the amount of material and information that was just thrust upon you immediately. And the expectation was very similar to, you know, like I said, this, here's the instructions, figure it out. That's what it was. It was, I expect you to know this already because I told you once 16 hours ago, yeah, I don't care how tired and sleepy you were. I said it once, so you're going to be held accountable to that standard. And yeah, that's what it was. It was wide open throttle. It was fire hose all day. Yeah, it was pretty incredible. Before you move on, Reed. Yeah. Can you explain why is it that way? Why would OTS be structured that way? This line upon line, precept upon precept, adding a little bit more and more and more until it's like this super intense, like you said, drinking from a fire hose effect. Why would we structure our commissioning sources that way? There's a number of reasons. And we'll definitely talk about this as we go through the second part of this series, which I guess is the instructor side of things. But one is stress inoculation. I know we've talked about that, Colin, in some previous episodes, how important it is to be prepared for the winds of hate and for the challenges that are going to come. And, you know, I actually have been in incredibly stressful, very high pressure situations and been able to keep my cool directly because I've been through harder things. And this is one of those harder things. This has to be hard in order to prepare you for what is going to come. So that's one. Two, that's how we learn is one piece at a time. And the expectation, the demand, the demands placed upon you are very high. And so we are going to force you to find where your limit is and go beyond it because that's where growth is. Additionally, when you break, and I don't like to use that, you know, people say, oh, we have to break you to build you up. I'm not sure that's necessarily the case, but I do think that you need to know where your limits are. Also, you need to know how to rely on other people. This is an individual event, officer training school, just like ROTC is. You are being assessed as an individual, but you will fail by yourself. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure, as we go. Do you have any other thoughts on why it's built that way? No, I think you hit it exactly what I was looking for, is that this is all by design to achieve a specific effect, you know, a specific training adaptation within our officer trainees, within our cadets, within the people that are going to become the future leaders of the Air Force. And let's remind ourselves that this is not a job. This is a profession. And there are very specific requirements 
for success in this profession that may directly rely on your ability to remain cool, calm, and collected in a stressful situation and to learn and retain information under that same stress. Now, I'm not saying that every day that you are on active duty, you're going to have people screaming at you. Not every day you're going to be waking up at 4.30 in the morning and have to immediately figure out where all your people are. I mean, you might. That may actually happen. But more, it's like you said about that inoculation against stress and that preparation for some of the different types of operations that you're going to be involved in as an officer in the Air Force. Yeah, absolutely. We don't do it because we think it's fun. We do it because this is the best way to prepare you for what's coming. Yeah, absolutely. And I do, I've already mentioned this a little bit, but I do want to emphasize, I never felt personally demeaned or attacked. I always felt that the judgments being waylaid upon me in a direct manner were fair, that the standards were communicated, and when I'd failed to achieve them, that the instructions were relayed again with emphasis. You know, I never, ever felt that I was less than or subhuman or insufficient as a human being, but my performance did fail to meet standards a number of times, you know, so I always understood where they were coming from. It always seemed to make sense to me. And you're using really colorful language, which is wonderful and beautiful, and I really like it. But Reed, did they yell at you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did they knife hand you? Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay. So... Let's just call it what it is. Let's accept that this is part of the training environment. This is part of the experience that is going to help you prepare for this profession of arms. Yeah, absolutely. I'm smiling again. I don't know what's wrong with me. Anyway, all right. So for the first few days, and I'm not entirely sure, again, it's all kind of a blur. We didn't actually see any officers. We only saw our upper class. We didn't even see enlisted members. We saw our upper class. After a few days, when they kind of thought we were, air quotes, ready, then we were introduced to our flight commanders and our student squadron commander. Now, OTS is set up like a wing, except it's made of staff members. And so you're in a flight and you have a flight commander who is an officer. That officer is your primary instructor as well as your primary supervisor. And then... You have three or four flights which form a student squadron. And that student squadron is also led by another officer, either a major or more often than not a captain. And they don't have their own flight, but they're in charge of the training of that squadron. And then a group of three or four squadrons forms essentially the cadet wing. And that's done very deliberately to teach the structure of the Air Force. It makes sense when you're there. On paper, it looks really goofy, but as you experience it, it kind of makes sense. And those were pretty intense situations when we met these officers. Prior to this experience, I had spoken to an officer on the phone before for an interview, and then a almost retired major swore me in at MEPS. So other than that, I'd never even seen a military officer. I got to tell you, Colin, these people look straight out of central casting. The uniforms looked amazing, whereas mine didn't. I mean, we all stank. You know, when you get 25 seconds for a shower and you're all, you know, head shaved because you know it's going to be easier than actually keeping your hair, we looked terrible. We smelled terrible. And here they are, confident, well-spoken, dressed well, and it's super intimidating. You're like, yeah, I'm never going to look like that. But you were hoping. And then, yeah, as soon as actual military officers showed up, there's more rules to follow. And again, surprise, we're not meeting the expectations and the pressure just continued to increase. In and around the same time we were introduced to our flight commanders, the MTIs came into being. Now, that's different than what it is now, but this was my experience. What is an MTI, Reed? Military training instructor, also known as drill instructor. These are the folks that wear the campaign hats These are the folks that you see on the YouTube videos. The hat that was worn by the gunny in full metal jacket, you know, he is a drill instructor. That's who these people are. And again, remember my roommate, right? Ice in his veins. He deployed nine times in eight years. (laughs) Completely unflappable, right? Like this guy's, he's done some stuff and he wasn't even sweating. I mean, he'll have five or six people hollering at him. He's just cool, calm, collected. He heard what they call taps. You want to describe what taps are? (laughs) 
I'm laughing because I have that same sound ringing in my ears right now. So the taps, so they're cheater taps, they're pieces of metal that drill instructors will put on their shoes, on their boots, on the bottom and on the inside of their heels so that when they move around, you can hear them. It scrapes the ground. When they click their heels, it makes a really loud metallic sound and it's very distinct. So yeah, when you hear it, you know they're coming. Yeah. And they're actually really useful for teaching drill. You'll see a lot of, you know, folks that are in honor guard and things like that use them in order to provide additional cues for drill and things. So they're functional, but they're definitely like a signature of the MTI, right? And he heard the clicking of the taps and he went white. <laughs> and I didn't know what was happening, but I knew that because of his reaction that it was about to get real. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, can they possibly ratchet this up anymore? How far into training are you at this point? 96 hours, maybe more. I'm not entirely sure. Okay. That's, again, it hasn't been a full week yet. Uh, I'm not sure. All right. Early, but it wasn't immediately, right? So the first few days, it was almost all lower class. And then it was the officers. And right around the same time, the MTI showed up. And yeah, picked up on his nonverbals. This is not going to be good. And then... I mean, it went to 11, right? <laughs> I could not believe that it could get more intense. And I still get like the willies thinking about that first day with the MTIs. We had one, I'll never forget his name. I'll leave it out. But he would yell, hurry up in this very distinctive rhythm. Hurry up. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I am certain that on my deathbed, if I hear that, like I will snap to attention. I'm sure that's going to happen anyway. Yeah, yeah, they were good. And everyone has a little bit different style of adding pressure to you. My student squadron commander was very intense, very loud. My flight commander, on the other hand, she was a diminutive female. She was not large. She could not pull off the like intimidating presence thing. If she yelled, it didn't have the gravitas, you know, that a larger male often has. So she would do the disappointed mom thing where she would just look at you and just look disappointed and you felt like you were about two inches tall. So there's a whole lot of different ways to add stress and pressure. And hers was the disappointed mom. And the other thing was, is all of the flight members in my flight were male. So she was like our mom in a way. And so she pulled that off pretty well. And can I just say there that that's not by any means a negative. That's not a slight against her. That being a mom figure to cadets is totally okay. Being a mom figure to your airmen, it goes right in line with everything that we've been saying about what it means to be an officer. It's to be that father or that mother figure to your people, loving them, taking care of them, but instructing them in the standards, holding them accountable, making sure that they are learning the things they need to know in order to be successful. So I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't want to also say that she didn't yell at us. She did. And when she did, boy, we felt it, you know, because it was like a tool she only brought out every so often. Anyway, yeah, that was my flight commander. Now, a couple things about OTS. And Colin, I believe now that field training has moved to Maxwell, you also have this document, but it's called the OTS manual or the Otsman. Do you guys get that issued now? Yeah, we call it the field training manual. Okay. Or FTM. Yeah, so we call it the Otsman, the OTS manual, and it's one of those things they give you on day one, and turns out it's a really useful document. It has pretty much everything you need to know to be successful is in that tiny little book, and it happened pretty regularly. We'd be getting hollered at for something, and you know we're kind of looking around, looking at each other like, do you know what they're talking about? Do you know? They're not? And we couldn't remember, you know, because so much information is being thrown at us all the time. Sure enough, we'd look it up in this book. And I was like, oh, well, it says right here on this paragraph exactly how to do this thing. Maybe I should pay attention to the stuff they give me. So we started studying it more and more and more and more. And then we would actually apply it proactively. And they would be rather pleased that we had figured out how to OTS. I remember once, I'll never forget, we were sitting around and one guy in our flight just loses it. He's like, hey, it doesn't say anything in here about dessert. <laughs> now, eating the dining facility, the DFAC, was one of my least favorite experiences of OTS. Why? There are so many rules. So many rules. 
which side of the aisle to get to the table you walk on, which chair you select, where your tray goes, where you pass the napkin. I mean, it just good grief, right? You'd think eating would be easy and straightforward. Forget it. We'll talk about why that matters later on in the instructor portion. But Good heavens, I hated chow. It was the worst. I mean, yeah, I needed the calories, but it was like, I need to get this over with immediately. And I mean, just walking through the line to get your food, you could, anyway. All right, so (laughs) there's desserts in the center of the cafeteria portion where you get your food. But there's so many rules that you're like, I don't know how to go get that. I really want some cake right now. That would do a lot for my emotional status. (laughs) Emotional eating at OTS. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) It's not like you couldn't use the calories. I mean, you could eat anything. When you're going a million miles an hour from 0430 until 2300, you're fine. Just eat it. It'll be fine. Anyway, but you couldn't figure out how to get there. And as he's reading through that, he figured out how to go to that portion of the cafeteria to get dessert. And I mean, it was like, he's like, I'm going to do it today at lunch. I'm going to do this. And he's studying. He's getting all ready. He goes, he gets dessert, nothing happens. He's eating cake, like in the chow (laughs) hall. And everyone's looking at him like that guy, (laughs) that guy. And almost immediately, the entire cadet wing knows how to get cake. And it was fascinating to see how news spread. And that guy walked like 15 feet tall for the rest of the week, right? Because he had figured this out. But that's a really good story to kind of encapsulate what OTS was, right? Now, did the instructors there use some sort of demerit system, like the Form 341 or anything like that? Absolutely. Yeah. So the Form 341 is a merit, demerit form. They can also be used for excellence, right? So if you do something exceptionally well, you're going to be asked to produce a 341, and the flight commander is going to fill it out and say all the wonderful things you did. But more often than not, they were negative when you sucked. Uh, They would highlight your suckiness, and they would pass it on to your flight commander. The 341s were kind of used for more grave situations, if you will. And yes, we did have a demerit system. We actually didn't use that as staff when I was an instructor. It became kind of meaningless because take a demerit. You're like, okay, you know, and and they didn't really add up or do anything particularly. 341s became a pretty useful training tool, though, as I was a staff member. I was curious, though, did the guy who got the dessert, did he get recognized officially in any sort of way, or he was the guy that got his cake? Oh, the guy was the god for like a week. I mean, he figured it out. (laughs) I mean, if you haven't had chocolate in two months and all of a sudden you have chocolate ice cream, I mean, yeah, he was pretty good, dude. I don't remember officially, but yeah, you know, that's a real like microcosm of what OTS is. The guidance is available. Go out, get it, apply it, tell others. We are not going to hold your hand through this, you know, and that's the way the training is established. Yes, we are going to point you in the right direction, but goodness, get after it. Learn. You know, we are not going to hold your hand through the whole thing. Yeah, I love that so much that the necessary information for mission success has been provided. Everything you need is here. You just have to be proactive about going and getting it. And then I love that last part that you said, once you have that information, go share it with others. Please go help other people be successful because as we've said before, and we will say many, many times again, it's not about you. It's about the success of the group as a whole, the entire team, the entire wing, the entire Air Force. Absolutely. And yeah, that is a core tenant of the entire way the training is set up. Something I've mentioned very briefly, but we'll talk a little bit about here is you have to march everywhere the whole time. And Marching is not casual at all. It is the antithesis of casual, if you will. It's a very deliberate action. Colin, we could probably do, you know, an entire series on the value of drill. I know you're, I mean, almost a doctor in the subject. So yeah, Yeah, we'll do that after I am the doctor of drill. We'll save that one. Yep. I'm looking forward to it. I'm a big fan. At the time, I wasn't. Marching is a pain in the neck, especially when you literally do it everywhere you go out of doors. At OTS, until you earn your pennant, you have to be escorted by someone who has earned a pennant. In other words... What's a pennant? Technically, it's a piece of cloth that is attached to a staff known as a guidon, and it has your flight 
designator on it. There's a whole lot of history and heritage that goes along with it. But think of it, if you will, like your driver's license. Your flight cannot go anywhere by itself without your pennant. And in order to earn that, you had to pass a series of, you had to basically demonstrate in front of the MTI, who was the lead for drill, that you could follow guidance appropriately and not look like a smash bag of donuts out there marching around. And I remember how important this was to us because when you have to have other people escort you, they don't want to do that. They've got stuff to do and they're always grumpy. And just being able to march ourselves somewhere meant like five minutes away from them. And we really wanted to get that. Is our ability to march, you know, directly related to our abilities as members of the profession of arms? You know, it's not entirely. We'll have that discussion later, Colin. I see you getting geared up. Yep. But what I'm getting at is our ability as a flight to successfully train and pass our pennant test did reflect on our character. It reflected on how hard we worked and how well we were willing to become a team. And we knew that and we got it. We did not pass our first pennant test. That was frustrating. We were the only flight in our student squadron to not pass our test the first time. Lame. We felt it and we felt really unhappy about it. We went out and passed our second test. And later, our ability to march actually became a source of pride. We started using some old Jodies and we would actually get positive 341s from MTIs saying, hey, you guys look sharp out there. Love hearing those Jodies. Love your enthusiasm. You're doing good things for the wing. We looked sharp and we knew it and we felt good and that mattered. And there's nothing like having an MTI who at first tells you you can't even breathe straight, you know, breathe correctly, telling you, hey, you guys look sharp out there. You know, you're bringing some honor to the program. So marching, love it. We're going to start moving into a little bit about kind of the nuts and bolts of OTS. So in order to graduate and commission, you have to pass a series of things. There's academics, there's field evaluations, there's classroom evaluations, there's briefings, papers, bunch of stuff. And I got to tell you, it's a very different environment than you've ever been in before, unless you've gone through some sort of other basic training. Because of the way we were structured right with an upper class and lower class, at the time, if you were struggling as an upperclassman, they would wash you back to the lower class and kind of give you a second look. If you failed again, then they would send you home. And I'll tell you, there's nothing like seeing an upperclassman pack their bags and get into their car and drive off wearing civilian clothes to impress upon you the importance of meeting the standards. And we saw that. We saw upperclassmen pack their bags and leave. If you fail a class in college, other people may not even know, right? You don't know every single person in all your classes by name. You don't recognize that they've had to drop out of college because you probably don't even know who they are. You know, these are people we had lived with. We knew who they were. We understood the impact this was going to have on their lives. And it's serious business when you're standing out in formation and you watch someone carry their duffel do the long walk to the parking lot. Yeah, that is a long walk. And they're also not going to get another chance. They leave, you know, depending on the exact circumstances of their removal from training. But if they were washed back that one time, given a second look, my guess is that they're being removed from training with prejudice. Something that says there is an extreme character flaw here, some sort of giant red flag that is saying this person is not qualified to become and should not be given another chance to be an officer in the Air Force. So that's it. They're done. That long walk is the last time that they're ever going to be part of a commissioning source. They're done. Exactly. Yeah. A lot of these categories, you know, there's a ton of legalese and all the guidance is out there, but we've actually had people that are trying to apply to other services say, Hey, can you change my disenrollment category? Because now the Marines or the army won't let me in. No, that's it. You had your shot and it didn't work out. So yeah, pretty serious stuff. And academics are a big part of that. Academics in like, no kidding, you have to study, you have to take a test, you have to pass the test. We actually had one of our flight mates that had a real close call. And I think this kind of was a big part of my, my training experience. Prior enlisted, awesome guy. And he was the number one contributor to our success as a flight. He was always looking out for everybody else. He worked super hard. He was smart and just a good dude to be around. But testing was hard for him. 
the academic portion was something he had struggled with. It impacted his ability to promote as an enlisted member. It had made college hard for him, and he was struggling. In order to graduate, you have to maintain a passing grade. At OTS, a passing is 80%. If it's a 79, that's a fail. If it's 80 and above, that's passing, but only just. Now, you had to have an average of 80% on all graded measures. That would allow you to fail a few things, but it also meant that you had to keep your average above 80, so you still had to do well on the other things. At the time I was going through, there were four academic tests, and he had passed the first test, but only just, and then he had failed the next two and failed them pretty hard, and he had to get like a low to mid 90s on the last test, or he was going to be out of OTS. And this was something we were not okay with. He clearly deserved from everything he was doing to commission, but he's got to meet the standard, right? Just like as an example, OTS was part of a 10 year plan that he had begun shortly after he had joined the Air Force. He'd been working for this deliberately for a decade. He wanted to be a pilot. He had gone to get his private pilot's license. I mean, he had been doing this, like this very deliberate step-by-step process for a decade. And we were going to make sure that he got the best shot. And we worked so hard. I remember the day we were grading the exam. Basically, you go, you sit in a room, it's a multiple choice test. You take your test, you fill out a bubble sheet. And at the same time you fill out a bubble sheet, you fill out a companion bubble sheet. And that second one is like your unofficial grade. That way you can go back upstairs, flight commander will sit in the room, and then he or she will give you what the answers are. So you have an idea of what your score is. Because I will tell you, students will pass out if they don't know what their score is, you know, less than half an hour after they take it because of how serious it is, right? They have got to pass this. Yeah, it's one of those things I would always, you know, break when I was an instructor, I would always give the students the answer to whatever it was, because I knew they wouldn't sleep, you know, if they didn't know what was going on. Anyway, I'll never forget, right, the whole flight, flight commander, she's shaking as she's giving the scores, you know, because she knows, she knows how good this guy is. But she also knows that if he doesn't pass this test with like a 93, he's going home. And that was it. This is the same flight commander that you were describing before, the disappointed mom. Yeah, 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 she cared about us. You know, she knew he deserved it. And I'll never forget, we said the last score and the whole flight turned and looked right at him. He's like, got what I needed. You know, what a feeling, what a feeling that was. And I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it right now. Me too. And I wasn't even there. Yeah. So again, I want to emphasize OTS is an individual event that you will fail if you do it by yourself. We had spent untold hours doing flashcards, quizzing. I mean, we're standing in formation, you know, maybe we're at ease. We'd start asking him questions. You know, what was the National Security Act year that established the Air Force? You know, and and you do just whatever it was. I don't remember exactly where we were, but we absolutely hammered it for weeks and we got him over the finish line. And he told us that that is a good feeling, you know, to see someone up there getting those gold bars pinned on and you feel like you own that a little bit. Uh, It's really, really important lesson for me. Yeah, I love these stories that you're sharing that really demonstrate this team mindset there at OTS. Like your roommate on that first day, you know, just saying some kind words is the thing that got at least you and maybe your other roommate there with you, got you through that night, that next day. And then here's another example, you all coming together, rallying around this other guy in your flight, making sure that he had the tools that he needed, he had the information so that he could be successful. You weren't concerned about yourselves as individuals, you were concerned about other individuals and their success and the overall success of the team. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. If anyone, you know, if our audience takes anything away from this, I can't emphasize it enough. OTS is an individually graded event that you will fail alone. So for all those students who are thinking about it or have class dates, you have got to figure out how to get along and get together with your flight so you can succeed. All right. So weeks have gone on as we learn and grow. The pressure starts to subside as we prove that we've demonstrated the ability to perform as required. The final test, if you will, for the lower class is to put on graduation for the upper class. So graduation is like a graded measure and the lower class is in charge of it. No pressure, right? You know, these people that have been running your life for the last six, seven weeks are graduating. They're commissioning. So don't screw this up. 
because all their families are going to be there, you know, 25 general officers and 100 colonels and untold numbers of majors are going to show up. So don't screw this up. One of the neatest parts of graduation at the time, the upper class and lower class would march together through the graduation parade. And then right at the end, the upper class would march close to the podium and then they would receive their oath of office and be sworn in as lieutenants. And then they'd throw their hats in the air and we'd be all standing there watching. Talk about a motivation, right? To see these people, you do form relationships with them, especially as you get closer to the end, you realize, yes, they are upper class, but they're my peer. And we are in this together. And that's a transition that happens in the last few weeks of their time. But boy, you're like, man, that's going to be me in six weeks, right? You really start to feel it, you know, for once, like, oh, we can actually see, we might actually get there. So really neat to put on the graduation. And right after that, they leave. We'll talk about graduation, you know, from my perspective here in a little bit, but, and then you become upper class and you can go off base, Colin, and eat food that is not defect food. Oh my word, it's so exciting to have anything other than what's cooked at the dining facility. I don't want to demean the defects. They do a great job, but six weeks, three meals a day, you're done. You're ready for anything other than defect. But we also had to then prepare for the arrival of the lower class. So real quick, I'm picturing in my mind, you know, Braveheart going like, freedom! No, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, so good. Now, I don't drink alcohol. But that was also something that was allowed at that point in the training. And really, yeah, I remember going, you know, the first night that the guys could go get a beer or a whiskey or whatever, and how excited they were. Like at the O club, could they go to the officers club there on base or they could, but we actually went off base. Interesting. Okay, cool. There are rules about it. I don't know how it's changed and morphed, but yeah, you could go to a bar. It had to be at a restaurant. It had to be with dinner and a bunch of other things, but in uniform. No, no. So we couldn't go in uniform. Okay. At the time I went, we had these really terrible, like civilian uniforms. They were a blue polo that said like OTS Mm -hmm. on the chest. And then your name was embroidered on one side and you had to wear khaki slacks. And that was like your off base uniform. So you could be identified. And that's the, the typical civilian equivalent uniform. Yeah. Oh, I think we went to Outback. <laughs> so good. Anyway, all right. There are actually some really good restaurants in the Montgomery area near Maxwell Air Force Base. So Yeah, they do a good job. Yeah, they do. Oh, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> but especially after six weeks of defect food, yeah. Yeah. Anything. Yeah, it was pretty great. Anything is going to be just a little piece of heaven for you. Yeah, it was great. All right. So, yeah, we had to prep for the arrival of the lower class. and. This is a good time to bring up, like, everyone has responsibilities at OTS. I'm sure it's the same at ROTC. I'm sure it's the same at USAFA. Everyone has a role that they have to fill. It's an opportunity for training. Plus, you got to get stuff done. And so my job, I was the mail and logistics. And I chose that deliberately because I thought it would be nice to bring some happiness to people every once in a while. You know, show up. Hey, I got the mail. Here's a letter from grandma and a package from your girlfriend. You know, just brighten their day a little bit. I was also responsible for moving like supplies and equipment, getting MREs distributed, things like that. There is no such thing as an easy job. Let's get that out there. I get that question a lot from students, especially, hey, I've heard some jobs are easier than others. There's no easy jobs. There are some that are hard, but there are no easy jobs. They're all used for training purposes. They're also what you make them. So if you get a job because you think it's going to be easy, just don't. Just get something because you know you need to contribute. When you become upper class at the time, you got more jobs, right? This pressure never ended, right? It wasn't like, okay, now we're good now. No, it never stopped. It just changed. There were a number of us who were selected to directly train and interact with the lower class. It was actually a lot smaller percentage than you'd think. Only about 15% of the upper class was allowed to interact with the lower class. And yelling and screaming at people sounds like fun until you are asked to do it. It is work, right? Colin, can I get an amen? Amen. It is work. And you have to really try and learn how to do it effectively, 
or otherwise you're just not getting any good out of you. You're not getting any good out of what you're trying to accomplish. So it's real work. You also can't be a hypocrite. So if you're going to hold someone accountable to a standard, you always have to be demonstrating that standard. You can't have a bad day. You can't mess up. And at this time, both my prior enlisted roommate and myself were, you know, some of these people that had been asked to do this. So not only do we have to keep ourselves to the standards that we've been trained to, but now we have to worry about others. And I mean, it really ramped up our training. You know, I thought we were busy. Now we have to take care of 150 whatever students. Yeah, good luck. It just kept going. As training goes on and you perform well, you get more privileges. Your time constraints tend to go away a little bit. And especially as you start knocking out graduation requirements, I still remember I took a uniform to get my lieutenant rank put on it, but I kept it in my car because I was afraid of looking at it, right? <laughs> like I, I didn't want to see it because I didn't want to jinx myself. And then, you know, every time I knocked out a graduation requirement past that evaluation, whatever it was, that was like a, a little notch in the belt. Like, oh, it's actually going to come. It's getting here. I'm getting pretty excited. When it comes to assignments, it depends on who you are and how you got there and where you're headed and what kind of job you have. So by assignments, you're not talking like OTS assignments, curriculum, graduation requirements. You're talking like your assignment for what you're going to do and where you're going to go for the Air Force. Yes. Okay. So I'm talking about where you're going to live for the next three or four years, those kind of assignments. If you're a prior enlisted and you are attending OTS, you are TDY en route. That is your duty status. As a result, every single prior enlisted member has their follow-on assignment before they arrive. They know where they're going. A lot of them will actually move to that location and then come back to Maxwell. Some do it literally en route. Some have moved their families. I mean, there's kind of different ways people do that. For the non-priors, it depends on your job. So if you are, for example, going to a career field that has one location for an extended technical training, cyber, Intel, space, those have trainings that last six months or more and you're going to PCS to those locations, you know where you're going. If you're an Intel Airman, you're going to go to Goodfellow Air Force Base. So you know where you're headed. And then it's at Goodfellow that you'll get your actual next here, I'm going to live for three years. Pilots, they've got a few more options, four or five locations, I don't recall exactly, where they could go for undergraduate pilot training. And so if you're like an engineer or a scientist like myself, you actually go straight to your first assignment. There's a couple other career fields that do the same. Logistics, I think, is one. Maintenance might be another. I don't remember. But yeah, just one day you show up to your flight room and there's a piece of paper sitting there and it's like, congratulations, you're going to be going to X. It's like, oh, you know, this is kind of exciting. I got selected to go to uh, Patrick Air Force Base, soon to be Patrick Space Force Base. Pretty excited about that. It sounds so weird. And yet exciting all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of PAFB, it'll PSFB. Uh, anyway, it's going to be a space base. A space base. That's great. It already is a space base. It's just going to get a new name. I mean, the 45th Space Wing's there. They're the main dog on the base. Anyway, so I'm pretty excited, right? Cocoa Beach, Florida, Kennedy Space Center, Cape Canaveral, Cocoa Beach, Cocoa Beach. You know, <laughs> I'm pretty excited about this. <laughs> so there's some other things we can talk about. So... Since I've been involved with OTS, since I went and then back as a staff, there's always been some sort of formal dining event. When I was there, it was a dining out. Colin, would you mind explaining what a dining out or a dining in is? Yeah, dining out is a extremely formal kind of black tie event where everybody gets dressed up in their finery. If they have it, officers wear what's called a mess dress, which is essentially a tuxedo, but a uniform version of it. There's an enlisted version of it too, but they're also authorized to wear a modified service dress to these events. And yeah, it's exactly as it sounds. It's super formal. There's a lot of heritage and tradition that comes along with it. There's usually some sort of like ball or dancing afterward. Yeah, they're a lot of fun, especially, you know, if you have a spouse that likes to get dressed up and you know, get all gussied up and go to a fancy dinner, dinner dance kind of thing. That's what it's all about. Dining in, on the other hand, especially a combat dining in, is far less formal, but still just as fun. The idea with a combat dining in is that you're going to wear some form of uniform, some form of military or paramilitary uniform from the past, present, or future, or 
other universe <laughs> and come together and play games or get into some sort of like water or food fight or something along those lines. Shenanigans. Yes. Also known as shenanigans. Shenanigans. And usually these events are mandatory. And so they are mandatory shenanigans. But yeah, that's dining in, dining out. Yeah. A couple key things. If it's out, other people are allowed to attend with you. If it's in, it's the military members and the unit only. So that's kind of a big key divider. I've actually had formal dining ins as well. Just the unit and everyone's wearing mess dress. Those are less common. Most often they're combat dining ins, as you described, Colin. And yes, much, much shenanigan. I just made that word up. All right. So shenanigan. Love it. Yeah. All right. So at the time, OTS had a dining out, the student, the staff, and partners. We wore our mess dress. Everyone was privileged to see me in mine. It's the best looking uniform I own, and I look great in it. And it was a fantastic experience. We hadn't seen our partners at that point in 12 weeks. We all get dressed up. We go to the O Club, have an incredible meal, you know, great memories. It was a really wonderful experience. Had a great time. We'll talk about that later as a staff because it takes a couple different forms, but there's always some sort of formal event. Always really enjoy those. Now, were you commissioned at this point when you had your dining out or you were still in OT? We were still cadets or OT, like you said. It was the night before commissioning. I'm just curious for your uniform, did you wear OT rank or did you have your officer rank on it? We had OT rank. We had cadet rank. So we had to buy these shoulder boards. We didn't purchase them, but the staff provided them to us. And later on as a staff member, I had to maintain those and actually make sure they got distributed and collected. Because, yeah, you're not commissioned at that point. Interesting. Yep. I feel like I've seen from the most recent OTS graduation, I saw pictures of their dining out, but I want to say that they were commissioned at that point. Well, so, again, you have to remember that some of them are officers now that they attend. Uh, okay. So there yeah. may be few of them that were actually, and it's weird. I'm seeing the videos now. So the 24 TRS uh, training squadron, as well as OTS has a Facebook page. And yeah, they published some recent videos and I'm looking at, you know, a flight of students and I'm like, man, that guy's got captain bars on. You know, it's odd to see the mix of... Yeah, because of the integration of commission officer training with OTS, you know, the normal OTS. Yeah, so total force officer training, PFOT. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that may be what you saw there. All right, so let's talk about graduation. So grad week is clearly the highlight of the experience. Uh, you know, you've accomplished every single graduation requirement. Everything has changed. The staff start talking to you like you're a normal human being. You start to migrate from trainee into officer. Incredible experience. Grad week is structured slightly different, but bottom line, it's about a three-day event. So the day before graduation, the day before you commission and march in the parade is family day. So families will come to campus, you'll get to show them around, you'll get to take them to your room, you'll go to your flight room, you'll introduce them to your flight commander. There's usually some sort of formal welcome that the commandant or the group commander will put on and, you know, show a video and say nice things about your student. And it's a nice event for families to understand where you've been, what you've been doing. There's also some sort of awards ceremony that's been in the afternoon of family day. That's where the distinguished graduates are awarded, where the top graduate, where the honor flight and honor squadron are first notified that they were the number one flight in the cadet wing and the number one squadron in the cadet wing. Awesome events. You know, the students have worked super hard and it's really fun to recognize them. There's a number of other awards. I think the most prestigious is basically like the MTI's choice. If you, I don't remember the name of it, but basically the MTIs select the one student they would most like to follow. That is awesome. It is awesome. And I got to tell you, I love the MTIs and working with them was extremely rewarding. And they take that really seriously. They will lock themselves in a room for two or three hours and figure it out who is the number one student. And I think that's the most prestigious award you can earn at officer training school. Can we talk about the distinguished graduate out of... OTS, what that means, why it's important, you know, what that does for someone as they move on to active duty? Sure. So distinguished graduate is 
a recognition of the people who finish in the top 10% of whatever event it is. So this happens at a number of things in your officer experience. So it'll happen at SOS. It'll happen at Air Command and Staff College. It'll happen at your commissioning source. And basically, every single student, based on their performance, is ranked in terms of their order of merit. And the top 10% are awarded distinguished graduates. There is one top graduate who finished number one in terms of order of merit. And distinguished graduates, right or wrong, you know, being a DG has been used as a distinguishing factor when you're being compared against your peers. So if you're going to be looked at for promotion, if you have been a DG, at some point in your career, you were in the top 10% when compared to the rest of your peers. These DGs, a lot of weight has been put on them. Again, right or wrong, I think there's merit to the system. I also find some flaws with it. So it's hard to compare when you've got you know 300,000 plus people, how do you know who the quote unquote best are? This is one of the ways that the Air Force has chosen to measure people against each other. So being a DG is a pretty big deal, follows you for your whole career. It's actually on your official record. It's, uh, when you look at your records, it says commissioning source, OTS, DG, right on there. So it's a big deal and it matters. Yeah. One thing I want to say about it, though, I agree with you, Reed, right or wrong. It's something that exists in our system. There are good things about it. There are bad things about it. But in reality, what it is, it says that for that amount of time, eight weeks, nine weeks, 13 weeks, whatever the length of your training program, your commissioning program, you're in the top 10% for that amount of time. That doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to forever be top 10% as an officer in the Air Force. It just measures your ability against OTS as it existed at that point in time. It's not a reflection of your value as a person, your potential to be successful as an officer in the Air Force. It just says that for this amount of time, you are really good at this particular activity. Yep, and I would always counsel my students, if they were worried about it, they were probably in the wrong place, emotionally and mentally about it. At the same time, I also wanted them to understand it wasn't a big deal. So if they had achieved that, I wanted them to know that that was something to be proud of. All right. So that's uh, the day before commissioning. The day of graduation is amazing. It's an awesome experience. Each flight will have their own commissioning ceremony. It was really important as students and it is for the staff as well to give every single member their five minutes in the sun. And we'll talk a little bit about that later, but great experience. A lot of people have a lot of family and friends come. Distinguished visitors, we had three and four-star generals all the time coming to these. Really great experience. I actually, so you remember my, you know, ice water in his veins roommate. I actually asked him if he would commission me because he had such a huge impact on my commissioning experience. I respect it a lot. It's really cool. You get up there, you raise your right hand, and you give the oath of office. And then you have friends, family, loved ones come and pin on your rank. And then there's also an opportunity for a ceremonial first salute. A first salute harkens back to the time where senior NCOs or other NCOs would take young officers under their wing and kind of teach them how things worked. And as a way of saying thank you, because officer pay is so much significantly higher than enlisted pay, the officer would give them something, usually remuneration for that as a way of saying thank you for teaching them how things go. My dad served nine and a half years as an enlisted member in the Air Force, and he gave me a salute, right? My first salute as an officer. I did not make it through that without blubbering. I could not maintain my bearing. That's a pretty important and big deal to me, right? I mean, this is my superhero growing up, rendering me a salute. I mean, that's a really humbling experience. And I gave him a never circulated silver dollar as a commemoration of that experience. And for all you soon to be officers, make sure you have a silver dollar to give out to that first person who gives you a salute. That's a pretty special thing. Make sure you do that. It's a great tradition and a lot of fun. Yeah, don't blow that one off. You put some thought into it. Obviously, you're going to put some thought into who it is that you want to do your first salute. Put the same amount of thought into the silver dollar that you're going to give them. Have it be something special that you'll want to remember that they will want to hang on to rather than you know just go and cash it out for the amount of money that the silver is worth. Yep. 
I got two silver dollars. I got one uncirculated, you know, that was going to give my dad that was minted in the year of my commissioning. But I also got another one, like the real one, right? Because the ceremonial first salute, he's been out of uniform 20 years at this point, you know. But yeah, my first salute was actually really funny. We'll save that story for another time. Anyway, <laughs> something fun for me. My wife actually got me a gift for the occasion. She got me a watch and I still have it. And now at all of my promotions, I've been allowed to purchase another watch. That's a little fun tradition that I did for myself. It's something I look forward to. Completely unnecessary, but it's fun for me nonetheless. And yeah, everyone gets their own commissioning ceremony. It's really neat. A lot of people have their flight commander swear them in. A lot of people have, you know, some important mentor swear them in. Officers will move heaven and earth to get to a commissioning ceremony if someone asks them for the privilege of swearing them in. That's a big deal, really big deal. I had the privilege as a flight commander to swear in probably half of my students. And boy, what an honor. It really, really was. And no joke, if anybody asks me to do that for them, I will figure it out. I will make that happen. All right. So graduation ends just like it did for my upper class with a parade. So you get out there. You go through this parade. I was the guide on bear. So I'm the guy walking out in front of my squadron holding a staff. Pretty neat experience for me. We had A-10 flyovers. We had an A-10s do a flyover. Er. A-10s do the best. Yeah, they do the best flyovers, by the way. They're really good at low and slow and being time on target. Exactly. So good. Anyway, threw our covers up in the air. And that was it. And I mean it. You have like a half hour to get off campus. <laughs> You're like, you need to go now. You pack your car and you leave and you hope that you did everything. You know, you're like, wow, I really have to go now, right? Yes, you're done. Go to your next base. You're now an officer in the Air Force. Go. Don't screw up. You know, again, it just, it kind of put everything together again, this whole figure it out-ness <laughs> that is OTS. But yeah, we packed our cars and we drove off and immediately it had all changed, right? OTS for me was a seminal experience in my life. I was different after having gone through OTS. It's an extremely valuable experience for me. I look back on it with fondness. I know there's a little Stockholm syndrome in there. It was not all good, promise, but as is often the case in life, some of the things we value the most required the most of us and were some of the hardest things we've ever done. This has been awesome, Reed. I've learned so much about how officer training school works as a reminder for our audience, I did not go through OTS. I am not an instructor for OTS. So I have very little experience with OTS other than I have been to the campus and I've seen a lot of the things that you have described here, Reed. But I don't know of any sort of resource out there that is as detailed and as useful as something like this. So I appreciate you taking the time to you put all of these thoughts down and share them with us, share them with our audience. And I hope that they will see the value for what it is and I share it with other people. Right, thanks, Colin. I appreciate that. And I genuinely do enjoy talking about this. I could go on and on. There's so many more things. I've got great stories. I know, Colin, you are going to have stories from your time as a ROTC cadet. These are incredibly important, impactful, just densely packed experiences. And if the honest has any specific questions, again, as much as I can without giving away all the secrets that make training valuable, I'm happy to share more if you have any more questions. Yeah, so like we've done in the past, we'll link your contact information. We'll put your email in the show notes. You can also reach out to us through social media, Instagram, on Reddit. You can join us on our Facebook group, post your questions there, engage in the discussion with Reed directly, as well as other people there who are uh, anticipating becoming an officer through officer training school. So this has been a great explanation of what life is like as a cadet or an officer trainee going through OTS. And we're going to leave it there, but we'll pick it up again next week with Reed continuing to explain what it's like at OTS, but this time from the perspective of being an instructor. Yep. Looking forward to it. I will tell you, if you thought it was interesting as a student, when you come back as an instructor, it's a whole different ball of wax. Absolutely. All right. Anything else you want to add there, Reed? Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.